Michel. Um, Shal and I met at a dinner, funnily enough, talking about food and the future of food. It's not often that someone has um, such a clear idea of what um, one's mission is, and I would love you to share a little bit more about that. It is not. <laughs> um, I'll let you present yourself and do your thing. Ladies and gents, please big Shal a big warm welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you, Victoria, for inviting me to share my view of uh, the likely futures of food, uh, things that would, uh, that would like to happen in the future, but also, I think, um, taking a bit of perspective and seeing food practices and, uh, um, and uh, well, it's something that happens several times a day for each of us, and uh, there's a huge things at stake uh, when it comes to food, so I'm just going to share these uh, few ideas with you today. Um, so I call this uh, uh, a path towards an art and science of eating. Uh, science of eating, well, there's plenty of food sciences um, that are looking at uh, um, understanding better uh, how it works at the molecular and physical level, but also uh, how we perceive food, how we produce food. Um, and all that we call gastronomy, the science of food, uh, or the, yeah, the science of food. So, but there's also an artistic part to it, and more and more people are looking into new ways of expressing through food, or using food as a medium, uh, artistic medium, or, um, you know, we see more and more different concepts, restaurant concepts. It's really, uh, something's happening, something, something is latent in food, um, in the food industries. Um, so I'm going to tell you shortly about my um, my uh, path in with food. So this is the place where I studied in France, very classical, traditional uh, way of approaching food. So really learning about techniques, how how to change the molecular and physical properties of food to, in order to engineer the deliciousness. This, that's what this is all about. Um, um, then I went uh, to work at this place. I'm gonna, cut short uh, a lot of story. This is uh, kind of the highlight of uh, my career as a, as a cook, chef. I don't like saying chef, chef because it means chief. Um, so I prefer saying cook, and actually I think that's more accurate. Um, so as a cook, I worked with uh, Nadia Santini. She was the chef, or, well, that's what uh, the Michelin guide said. Uh, but the chef was the grandmother, uh, the Nonna Bruna. Um, and, um, and so I learned something very important with these families, three generations in a kitchen, a restaurant that's been around for 80 years, that has three mission stars, uh, and that, you know, people pay 300 euros to go and eat there, to spend two, three hours there. Um, and Nadia was really triggered something in my curiosity. She said, we don't feed people only for five senses. We feed, uh, we feed more than that. Humans have more than five senses. We have also a sense of, well, that's what she said, sense of psychological wellness and another one of digestive wellness. If you think about it, when you have a stomach ache, it's not touch or smell or it's something else that's happening in here and we really do feel it, we sense it, it's part of our reality, our perceptions. And there's no such thing as a sense of digestive um, uh, wellness or, or perception. So she triggered my curiosity and yes, in terms of scientific, uh, in, in scientific terms there's no such there's still a lot of uh, to discover. That's that, that was uh, that was her, and she also was really sensitive, and she was really all about loving people, not only showing off uh, culinary techniques, uh, which was what I learned in in France. So those two things combined, I understood quite quickly that in order to make great food, or in order to touch people through food, you had to think about the products, the quality of the products, the quality of the ingredients, um, the technique that you use, of course. 
train your palate as much as you can, and sensibility. And that thing, I, that, this is, I think, in every, in every nice food experience, maybe even at home uh, with your family. That's, that's where it happens. But really, <coughs> flavor is not something that happens on the plate. Flavor is something that happens in the brain. It's a construction of the brain. Uh, the brain takes uh, stimuli from uh, all the senses and uh, combines that way with uh, experience, with imagination, with our, our genome. Also, takes a big part in there because we're not, we don't have all the same amount of taste buds, for example. We don't perceive the smells in the same way. So, flavor is something that happens in the theater of the imagination, let's say. It's not in the plate. And if you think about it, most chefs, uh, most cooks uh, are only thinking about food, and even food industry, they're only thinking about food in terms of what's happening in, you know, in the matter, in, in the physical and chemical properties of the foods, and not about what's happening in here. Of course, when you put a name on the food, then automatically there's a, there's a, a psychological component to it, and that's, that's where I think there's a lot of innovation to happen, not only in culinary techniques. Uh, that one. Okay, so my presentation is a bit changed, I think, because we're still a bit in PDF, so I'm going to swipe over a few uh, slides. So this guy, uh, 110 years ago, wrote a very interesting book that changed the way kitchens are organized, restaurants are organized, and uh, he said that cooking was going to become more scientific and more specific with time, and that is true. That um, uh, is really something that is happening nowadays more and more scientists, such as this guy, Charles Spence, he's uh, the professor with which I'm working, doing research at Oxford University. He is a psychologist, and he says that food is where all the senses come together. And that's interesting both to give insights to people that are designing food, but also uh, for scientists to understand a bit more about how the brain creates reality. Because, in a way, chefs or people that have um, a restaurants are intuitive multisensory designers. They have to think about all the cues, the sensory cues, in order to deliver a good product. So really, it's both it's beneficial both to scientists and also to the industry to uh, look more scientifically at how we create food. Uh, he also says that um, optimal design will increasingly come from reverse engineering the processes of the mind. And I think this is really important. This is, comes from a book that he uh, published last year on the sense of touch, the importance of the sense of touch. Um, and really, flavor is a very complex thing. Uh, if you smell something, that's the image on the left, you would only get one smell stimulated, one sense stimulated, but flavor here on the right is a very complex combination of sound, uh, taste in your mouth, smell in your nose, um, and the touch in the mouth, of course, but also the noise that in the, in the atmosphere and the whole psychological construct. Um, so this is what they call neurogastronomy. It's basically trying to understand the brain um, and, and, and what happens in the brain when, when we eat food. This is um, a salad I came up with um, after um, uh, I saw a painting of Kandinsky at the MoMA Museum. I turned, I saw like, this beautiful arrangement of colors and, and, um, and, uh, and textures and and lines and uh, this really a uh, color harmony and that was what Kandinsky meant uh, and I turned that into a salad thinking maybe I could borrow that aesthetic intention from uh, um, Kandinsky and turn it into something delicious so this salad Charles Spence professor he tried it and we went to the lab uh, I went there for a couple of months and we studied uh, the impact of this aesthetic presentation of food on flavor perception. Uh, we compared three arrangements of the same quantity of the same ingredients. Um, so the one on the, on, the, on the left would be the, the aesthetic inspired, the artistic inspired, and the center just tossed in the middle, uh, all the ingredients mixed up, and on the right, a neat presentation. And uh, we found that before consumption, the expected flavor, or the expected deliciousness was pretty much similar between the three. Like Everybody uh, thought that the three had the same taste, more or less. Uh, but after consumption, we found that the artistic presentation was uh, actually much tasting much better. Why? Why, 
what was it then? Just um, seeing something nice would affect our taste buds somehow. Um, maybe, maybe really what happened it is that, and this is kind of what we discuss in the paper, is that the value of something, any type of value, is rooted in the assumptions of the human performance in underlying the creation. So if we see something affordable, effortful, uh, we tend to enjoy it more, we tend to appreciate more its value. If we appreciate more its value, we take more the time to enjoy it. We are more mindful when we eat it. So the aesthetic presentation basically pe made people change their consumption behavior. They ate slowly, they tried different things, they went through a flavor journey with the same amount of the same ingredients, and they really enjoyed it more in the end. So this is uh, what they called so neurogastronomy, really uh, trying to understand what happens in the brain and, and how behavior and perception is changed depending on, on, on different cues of the, of the sensory experience. Um, so what does this food research look like if it's not you know, giving questionnaires to people and asking them how good things were? Uh, we're also doing uh, tests online, so this is a screenshot of an experiment that we're doing at the Science Museum uh, right now, asking people to rotate that plate. Seems like um, odd, fun, like funny, like why are they asking me to, to turn food uh, to the left to the right. Uh, well, what's happening here is, um, so this is another paper that we published recently, is uh, that the single, uh, the orientation of the single uh, V-shaped elements can change how much you like the image of food. If you like more the image of food, you take more time eating it, be more mindful about it, and probably the taste is going to be better. Uh, so this is a citizen science experiment uh, that's still running at the cravings uh, uh, exhibition. This is, uh, up the, on the right, it's uh, uh, the preference for orientation for this particular plate of food. And you can see that there's a strong preference for when it's pointing up, because when things are pointing towards us, if you think about the plate standing in front of you, if things are pointing towards you, it, it is considered as aggressive. And this is something that comes from very, very far away in time, uh, where when we saw something, some point, we would prefer it looking away from us than pointing towards. Um, okay, so that's not one on that. So why would plating, so just understanding, that's kind of very specific and the research uh, that we're doing, why would it matter really? Um, so, interesting thing, as I said um, before, can we change people's behavior uh, through plating? So. This is a plate. Uh, I was telling the story about this Kandinsky salad at a, at, a, at a talk, and when it finished, people just stood up and went and eat with, ate with their fingers and completely finished the salad. Uh, complete strangers went to the canvas and started eating with their fingers uh, without even asking the name of the person next to them. So that was nice because it broke off a, a lot of social conventions, eating with hands, eating with strangers, eating from the same plate without people, um, and all because there was some kind of curiosity triggered in their minds. So that's it. this is behavioral change in, in, in a talk, but it can also change, I don't know, in, in plenty of uh, different uh, social contexts at schools or at home. You can think of eating with hands. That would probably make food taste better, actually, because you integrate the sense of touch, a pleasurable stimulation, a tactile stimulation through your fingers. And bad matters are great sometimes. Um, uh, you know, eating, uh, eating, being really visceral about food is actually something pleasurable, making noise. In Asia, they believe that when you slurp and you make a lot of noise when you eat, food tastes better. It's a good, it's a good manner to, to, to make noise. Here, not. But if you see at the, at the basis of, uh, of actually the sensory integration, so if, if you hear noise, a congruent noise when you slurp, it's going to actually increase the pleasure, the, the pleasure potential of the same food, right? So, bad ma good manners, good manners, uh, right now in, in, in Western societies are actually not that good in terms of making us happier. Um, and um, so this is uh, down there. There's a, a paper that I really like, um, published in, in, in Science Journal, and uh, it talks about how important it is to change people's behavior to target automatic behavioral processes. Automatic means, for example, ease of access. If a food truck parks in front of there, uh, we're going to probably eat that because it's easy to access. It's, it's, it doesn't require a lot of effort. 
it's energy efficient for us as human beings to go just go uh, across the road. Same for the Tesco uh, down the road. Same for all the food that we find available uh, in our environments. Same on a buffet. So if the healthier food is put close to people, they're going to eat more healthy food. If healthier food is put onto larger bowls, they're going to eat more of that. If the, if the unhealthy ingredients are put into, into the larger bowls, people are going to eat more of those. So you can actually change how people take automatic, um, yeah, decisions automatically um, or orient them, uh, those, those behaviors via this psychological science-infused experience design. So what's the future of food? Uh, I'm going to go through several ideas uh, in, this, um, in, this, um, in this part um, that are related to the art and the science of eating. But before going, oh, just here, this is a very important image, actually. So do you know who this guy is? Yeah, OK, so he's a Chinese artist that made something amazing here at the Tate. Uh, he, you know what he's holding in his hands? Sunflower. Seeds, sunflower seeds, they look like sunflower, su sunflower seeds, but they're not. They're actually uh, little sculptures uh, painted by hand. Uh, so there are these two things. One is the abundance of food in which we live, and the other thing is the mechanization of uh, production, food production on one hand, but also artistic production on the other. This was made one by one by people in, in China for several months, and covered the floor of the Tate. That's an interesting couple of messages made by this artist. Um, but before continuing, I want to go back in time, uh, around 1.8 million years, actually, when we humans, uh, early apes, uh, managed to control fire. And we, when we managed to control fire, we had defense, we had a weapon to defend ourselves, to protect our family. But we also had something to transform foods, to make them more delicious on one hand, but also more, uh, we could absorb more energy out of the same amount of food. Um, so this primatologist from Harvard, Richard Branham, said he came up with the cooking hypothesis, saying that actually cooking and the control <laughs> of fire is what made us human. Um, and uh, he says so that we are the cooking apes, the creatures of the flame. If you think about it and you eat a potato, a raw potato, you're going to get probably only 5 to 10 percent of, of that energy, that potential energy absorbed through your gut. If you cook it, it's about 30 to 40 percent that you're going to absorb. So we had more energy efficient guts because we had cooked the element, pre-digested the element in the pot, so we had more time to develop language, to develop larger brains, which made us now the most um, yeah, invasive uh, species on the planet, and we're actually controlling the planet. We are controlling biology nowadays. So this is something that we often forget, but if we look at our biology, we are cooking apes. It's cooking is imprinted in our DNA, and loving food is imprinted in our DNA. Um, this what uh, the food landscape looked before. Uh, it wasn't like today. Think, compare this to a supermarket, right? And the decisions that you have to make in a supermarket, and the abundance, and the amount of effort going into each each very element of the supermarket. That was before. Now it's this. This is the food landscape now. We have machines. We have technology helping us. This is not bad can be bad, depends on how much, uh, on, on why it's done. Why do we intensify production like this? Why do we use the, the planet like this? Is it to feed people that are hungry or to feed cattle, uh, which meat is going to be wasted in your fridge, because it gone, or in the fridge of the supermarket, actually? And there's other, you know, like new ideas. For example, Soylent, you probably heard of those guys. Uh, they say that what if you never had to worry about food again? They had all the molecules that you need in order to have a functional body and brain is in this powder that you mix with water. And you don't even have to worry about food anymore because you just mix it up and have fuel. Uh, but I don't really agree with that. I think, uh, well, I think the pleasures of life uh, really matter and, um, and that deliciousness and pleasure is actually a force of evolutionary success. It's a force of, it's a drive of evolution. If we want to evolve towards a better species and to live more in harmony with, with the planet, we need to hear our desires, our natural desires, our hungers. Um, and um, come back to this one, which is another quote by Escoffier that I think is really important. Culinary art of food, by the form of its manifestations, depends on the psychological state of society. Think about Soylent. 
think about the organic movements, <coughs> think about GMOs, think about all this, and think that everything, everything is a manifestation of the psychological state of society. How about these guys? Um, they don't look appetizing there, but they're probably one of the biggest solutions that we have at hand, at reach, uh, which is uh, a, an energy efficient source of protein, <laughs> source of animal protein. Doesn't look that appetizing in the past slide, but here it might look better. Uh, this is a dessert I did not long ago from the hive uh, with pollen, uh, with brood. Brood sounds better than larva, right? Uh, so I, I chose that word, but I also tell you the, the, the other word, uh, which is larva. This is larva ice cream, bee ice cream. This is uh, bee larva ganache. So it's one of the best uh, uh, origin, uh, origin chocolates mixed with uh, brood, with larva. And uh, it's actually has the same larva, have the same uh, amount of uh, proteins um, than chicken, exactly the same. Um, and also, uh, it has a lot of umami taste. It's very meaty, it's delicious. And for desserts, it's actually very, very good. Uh, and also, there's plenty of, na of untapped potentials in nature. For example, seaweeds um, that we haven't really looked at. We're eating tuna mindlessly, and we're exterminating a species, or completely bringing an imbalance to the, to the ecosystems of the sea because there's a trend of sushi. Um, but we forget that in the sea there's other things that are actually quite, quite good. GM foods, we see that as, a, as the devil sometimes. Like, oh no, biotech, it's not, it's gonna, go, it's gonna go wrong. We cannot play gods, we cannot create, create genomes. But actually there's interesting solutions in there. Like for example, creating uh, salted water resistant plants, crops. Imagine just taking, now if you take a crop of maize uh, or anything, you just put salted water on top, it'll die. But what if you create a resistance to salt uh, and you can use salted water? You're going to create a crop that's much more, much more efficient in terms of energy and water consumption, right? And this is biohacking. It's a very interesting thing. Another one, people are uh, about two million of lives could be saved every year. This is data from the FAO. Um, by uh, increasing uh, vitamin A in diets. Uh, vitamin A, there's a golden, there's a rice that can act uh, um, genetically modified, and uh, it contains so uh, vitamin A, like part of uh, the, uh, the genome of the carrot put into a rice. And so you have this golden rice, they call it, and it can actually save a lot of people from starvation, from blindness. Um, so there, there are interesting solutions here. Uh, and also there's this emerging science of astrophysics, uh, which is quite interesting. It's very recent, and you're probably going to hear, hear a lot about it. What is it, astrophysics? So there's a, a scientist talked um, very interestingly about it. So astro astrology is watching how the stars move in the sky. Astrophysics is understanding why they move the way they do. It's understanding the physics of the movements in the, of, the, of, the, of the cosmos and the forces that, drive, that rule the cosmos. The same way, uh, gastrophysics, gastronomy, is just observing the phenomena of, uh, of, uh, related to food to, and the relationship between humans and food. Gastrophysics would be to understand the whys behind our relationship to food. And there's a lot of evolution in there that we need to understand why, why we came uh, we need to understand better where we came to know where we're going. Um, okay. But I think the future of food is actually here, and that's where gastrophysics could play a big role. Uh, it's with kids. If you can't cook, this is very obvious uh, once you read it, if you can't cook, you'll never be independent because you will always depend on others to feed you. Right? These kids, these kids of the future, um, well, the present and of the future, they need to have a different approach to food. They need to be taught different behaviors. Uh, they can be taught that uh, this is not just a broccoli. It's actually a flower with a very tender heart. Right? It sounds better. Like, broccoli is not a nice sounding word. <laughs> word. It's not. But if we change the name of this and, and, we, and we actually explain that right here in the center is the best part. If you go to a canteen today, if you go to kitchens as we speak right now in the world, there's plenty of kitchens of cooks that are cutting right here and throwing this away. And they're only cooking this 
overcooking it, so that's why it smells like a little bit sulfurous and kids don't like it, and they throw away the best part. So this is just 40% that goes to waste, right? Because of wrong procedures. And this is, I think, outrageous, and there's things that we can do on a daily basis, but I think it starts with teaching kids, and probably also teaching them uh, the science of the physics, the chemistry, um, uh, the perception, uh, all of these things are um, can be taught to kids, and kids are like sponges, and they absorb information, and they want information, but not uh, only maths and history. Um, and so, when we talk about revolution, coming coming back to the, the topic, um, well, we never left the theme of revolution, actually, because we'll be talking about evolution. And revolution is actually a, a fast change in evolution. Where do we want to evolve as a species? Um, I think there's one simple thing that we can do every day to change the world, little by little, and it's to think of the money we spend in food as a vote. When I go and take out my money and pay for a pack of strawberries, I'm voting for a certain organization, certain food organization, certain system, right? I'm voting for the person who actually grew that plant. I'm voting for him, I'm not voting for uh, political parties and all that, it's complicated, politics is very complicated, but if we, th if we see the money we spend as votes, it could be very interesting because uh, we understand what the impact we can have on a daily basis. This is the place, this is uh, the, the voting where you can vote right now, this picture I took on the way here at Liverpool Street Station. Um, well, you see a lot of fruits that come from Spain here. Spain is the place in Europe that produces more food, and they're actually delicious. Why? Because they have more sun, period. It doesn't come from too far. Uh, but if, we, if I want peaches in November or in December, it's wrong. Why? Because they come from the other side of the planet, and they have to pollute, they have to create a, a lot of, uh, of uh, carbon dioxide to, in order to get to me. But I don't, I don't even think about that. So if you vote for a peach in December or a strawberry in December, you're voting for a system that is not sustainable. If you vote for strawberries right now, yes, you're voting for a right thing. Hopefully organic, hopefully from very close to your place, to where we live, where you live. Um, okay, so I lost another, um, another slide here, but um, we're gonna end with this, which is that, uh, it's a quote from a, a chef that's, that I admire a lot, uh, 100 years ago, almost. He said that cuisine has to be a harmony that reflects the wonders of the earth. And if we see the big problems, the big challenge, challenges facing humankind, it's actually all to do with having that blue dot flying through the cosmos to survive. We don't want to kill any species on this planet. We want to survive us as a species. And we need to live in balance with the biology, with all the systems in this planet, because it's the only thing we have right now. We're going to have probably other planets in the future. But for now, we don't only have this one, and we have to take care of it, and we have to act today. Next thing you're going to eat, you can act. I think we can really change the world little by little by knowing and choosing what, what we put in our mouths. So, and every vote counts. So, you can start with your next meal. Thank you.